начинается сейчас. Все, я отключаюсь. Спасибо. Okay, so here we start. Um, hello, uh, this is a Center for Contemporary Music of Moscow Tchaikovsky Conservatory. My name is Sergei Cherkov, and we continue today our digital meetings uh, with composers as part of our collaboration with the Composers Academy in Tchaikovsky City. And today I'm happy to introduce Andrew Tuvi, a composer, researcher, educator, and artistic manager from the United Kingdom. Andrew studied composition with Jonathan Harvey, with Morton Feldman, with Michael Finnessy, and got a lot of very different influences that probably you will hear in his music. Uh, I will just uh, say a few, a few uh, things that are essential for me about his music. So that I think that, uh, well, his music has been performed over all over the world. And judging from my own experience uh, with his works, I would say that this is not least thanks to artistic flexibility of Andrew's approach to composition. So his artistic impulses draw from a variety of artworks, styles and genres, be it music, be it visual art, be it theater, uh, literature or whatever else. So it's difficult to categorize the music of uh, Andrew Tuvi, and he skillfully avoids any mm, conventions. And I believe he does so on artistic purpose, which makes his music even more fascinating. Uh, his artistic work uh, provides a methodology for his own research, artistic research. In 2018, I think he was awarded a PhD degree from uh, Birmingham uh, Conservatory and Birmingham University. In 1987, he founded an ensemble uh, called uh, um, Ixium. This is a reference to Morton Feldman work. Uh, Andrew currently teaches at the Conservatory of uh, Birmingham. And well, Andrew, I'm happy to welcome you at the Moscow Conservatory and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for that um, lovely introduction. I feel I almost don't have to say anything more about myself in actual fact. It's it's <laughs> done. So thank you. Um, now, what um, just to kind of capture some more things of what Sergei was just saying. Um, over the years, I, I really have, I think it, I could call it a passion for looking into lots of different areas of the music world and artistic world. So I've, I've by nature, never limited myself to just talking about music and the structures of music and anal analysis of music and things like that. that. Those things are a part of what we have to do as composers and, and people at universities and things. But actually, most of my life I've spent just exploring lots of different things. For instance, one of my favorite things to do is, is listen to music from all over the world. So since I was about 16, I've been lucky to be in an environment where I've had so many links and connections with different cultures that it's enabled me to kind of just enjoy lots of other things apart from what we just call Western music. So, you know, I might, for instance, have explored music from Japan, from China, um, from the Aborigines in Australia, you know, the um, First Nation of um, American people, um, Navajo people, etc. Um, and I've had enormous fun um, exploring these things. In the, the same with art. And so I, I spend my most of my time actually trying to get to art galleries to see different exhibitions of wonderful artists from all over the world. So I've been very lucky to be in a situation where I can actually just with quite easy access get hold of these things. And of course, now we all have the internet. So now everything is available to us. And in some ways, I've noticed that's almost stopped people exploring beyond the kind of initial pathways that they think about. So for instance, if you happen to be very interested in the spectral school or um, very complex music, or maybe um, minimalism or something, you can find that path and you can find out 
everything about it and you can see and hear as much as you want. Um, when I started out at university, of course, the internet didn't exist. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you actually had to go out and, and find these things and go to concerts and go to galleries and, and, and really kind of dig around in dusty shops to find scores of composers that you really like, but somehow weren't that easily available. And that, that sense gave me forever the, the notion of being able to always explore and be open to things that are around me. And that goes as much when I was a, a young person as I am now. Even now, I have moments when I'm completely captivated and captured by some music or some art that really triggers something in my brain about how I might compose what I'm doing. And I hope, I, I made a list of some pieces um, throughout this talk today that you might wish to listen to on YouTube and some of the links will be put up. Now we were talking just beforehand whether or not we listen to these as we go along or whether you, you get the set of links from Sergey and then test them out later. What I would say um, are two things if, if you have the time is I have a website uh, under my name Andrew Tuvey .co.uk and I have a YouTube channel if you put my name in there both of which are pretty exhaustive about my own music. Now the YouTube channel also incorporates a lot of quite rare footage of music that over the years has fascinated me including when I worked for a time in a secondary school and I spent time teaching um, 11 to 18 year olds about music and I put up videos of concerts I organize and things like that so you really can without my intervention kind of explore what I've been doing in many different aspects um, over all these years so if, if I begin when um, you know appropriately um, talking at the you know the Moscow Conservatoire which I'm extremely proud to do actually um, I, when I went to university, I went to a university outside of London in Guildford called Surrey. And um, what in the first term, in actual fact, for any of you who are students still, I, I got into university as a viola player, not as a composer. And I thought, actually, I'd, all, I'd been composing since I was about 10. And I still to this day, even though I've thought long and hard, can't work out quite how I learned to read music and quite how I learned to write music. It just, I'm not saying it just happened because it doesn't. I think it's a combination of um, my sister had a piano in the house, which I used to play extremely badly. And it sounded probably more like modern music than <laughs> anything I've written. Um, and basically I used to just explore as much music even at that time. Um, so when I, anyway, when I got into university, um, we were doing a concert where we had to kind of show our different kind of what talent we had as first years at university in our first term. And basically, I'd written a string quartet for some friends of mine um, that I played with in my local youth orchestra in London, uh, which was an enormous inspiration for me because we also worked with quite a lot of notable composers that used to come and talk to us about their music and things. So I was very fortunate in my situation to have access to such a range of, of people. Um, anyway, I played viola in my string quartet and I'm not a terribly good viola player to this day. I can, I can be honest about that at this stage. Um, and anyway, there we are, played this string quartet and um, at the end, the professor of the department came up to me and said, oh, Andrew, um, you're a composer. And, <laughs> you know, and I, I kind of looked at him, and I said, um, yes, I am. And I've, I'm enjoying that. But I, I really thought the way to make it in the music world was to play the viola and to get into an orchestra and to, to work my way. So I had a quite narrow sense of what was possible at that time. Maybe naive, maybe just young, whatever. Anyway, um, the next moment, um, a woman came up to me and she says, oh, I, I run the poetry department um, in the university. And I was wondering, I liked your string quartet and we have a Christmas concert in the Guildford Cathedral in December, in the beginning of December. Would you write a Christmas carol? 
and I thought, you know, <laughs> yes. Uh, so maybe that's, um, so I, I just said, oh, okay, I'd love to, but what words would you like me to say? And she said, oh, well, I'll write you some. And she said, oh, and you must join the poetry group as well. So off I went, wrote a Christmas carol, um, didn't really, no one told me, oh, it has to be in any style, it has to be anything. So I thought, well, how do I do this? So I basically took her words, I set them in a fairly conventional way, um, you know, some clash in harmony, but nothing, nothing out there at all. The one thing I did do, because although I'm not particularly religious, I don't disagree with religion. I'm just, it's not, it's kind of, it's not an integral part of my inner being for the moment. And um, so I, I also knew some Thomas Hardy, and he had written a text which said, after 2000 years of mass, i.e. communion, we got as far as poison gas. Now that was obviously written in the First World War. And um, I thought I wanted to have both the religious side and I wanted to have a kind of the opposite, which is saying, how far have we got in 2000 years that we've, we still kill people? And in actual fact, you know, we can all in truth say nothing has changed in our world in the sense we often have debates and we often have you know enormous protests and and what have you but people are still dying um and things are still happening so that sense of the opposites about how the world is actually set itself up in that carol and amazingly they did sing that particular section of the carol which is suddenly in terms of the harmony much more clashing much more pushing if you like pushing into i can't even say the 20th century or you know the kind of maybe early 20th century so it's still quite um conventional and quite traditional so the first piece that um you might wish to hear is called alleluia and it was written in my first term and performed in my first term at university in 1981. now um um, Sergey, do you, do we want to put that on or do we want to, shall I continue? And I just uh, tell her about things and then just move on? Uh, that's, that's up to you. So we can, we can, we can put uh, uh, the music or you can just continue. So it depends if it interrupts you or not. So. Um, I, I don't mind having like a minute of music. Maybe you yeah. can be our, our yes. person to just play a, like a minute, if that's okay. That's good. Let's do okay. This. okay. Okay. So, Alleluia. Yeah, just a moment. So now there will be the piece that Andrew was talking about.
OK. Yeah, so um, that's the rather conventional Alleluia. Um, actually, that recording, um, I don't think, goes on to the Thomas Hardy more clashing area. It may do. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so you might wish to listen to that and hear that. That's actually the very, that is actually the first recording that was made in the cathedral um, in 81. So it's a, it's a long time ago that that actually happened. Since then, it's had um, actually quite a nice life and performances and has recently been put on a CD and what have you. So um, it's another, it's an example of showing that I, had some sense of harmony and some sense of how to put things together, but also it's it's a, a possibility to remind people that pieces that we write when we're students or younger aren't necessarily things that we should kind of throw away or forget about. I think we just have to realise these pieces exist, um, they have performances, and, and sometimes there's some interest in them. Um, so as Prokofiev, um, I think once said, we're not always the best judges of our own music because I might kind of not normally start with a piece like that because it gives you, it might make you all think, oh, he just writes conventional kind of Christmas music or something. I mean, it's quite reflective, so it's not too kind of upbeat or anything. So, um, but I'm I'm taking a risk that some of you haven't kind of switched off and thought, oh no. Not, not another Christmas carol kind of thing, you know. So just to slightly contrast that, um, as Sergei correctly said, when I was studying with Morton Feldman, um, in the UK, in England, in London, um, there was actually very little of Morton Feldman's music being performed. And I thought, especially with a lot of the chamber music that he'd written, how fabulous it was. And these pieces that were like an hour long, and they were like in you had to kind of like completely almost like switch into an onto another planet and kind of zone out to kind of concentrate on them i thought we're not hearing these things at all so i set up a group with a just a group of very randomly found performers and other composers um just to enable us to do some feldman and very luckily um we got kind of interest from a couple of areas like the brighton festival and a place that used to be called the british music information center did regular kind of chamber concerts so in a very random by chance way we started to do a lot of feldman's music and because of it um really frustratingly for me um he, I decided I was going to go and study a long term with Morton Feldman in Buffalo. And I went out there and I applied for a big grant to be able to exist out there and all the rest of it. And this was all sorted out and it was all set up and it was wonderful spending time with Feldman and other people out in Buffalo. And um, sadly, I came back for a couple of months to London and sadly, Morton Feldman died, um, which was an enormous shock to me and um, made me basically stop my PhD. Um, and I thought, N I, I just don't want to do this. I could have carried on, I could have had someone else. And I thought, no, this was such a specific thing and he'd been such an inspiration to me. I just couldn't quite do it at that time. So I stopped and, um, and, and as Sergei quite rightly said earlier, I, I started a PhD only about, what, three, four years ago. Um, and some of you might think, but why do a PhD when you're in your 50s? Um, you know, what what can you do? In actual fact, I must say, it's the best time to be doing it. If you can put off doing a big, extensive postgrad research area until later in your life, it is perfect because you've actually accumulated quite a lot of a sense of not only knowledge, but a sense of how the world works as a musician and as an artist. And so I got a huge amount out of doing this PhD. And if you look onto my website, I put my very extensive commentary up. I wrote an awful lot of music during that time. And to be honest, it, it is just so positive. It's impossible to calculate. And what was fascinating, of course, I could rely on people 
over the years to perform the music that I wrote and to get involved in that. And actually, that was an inspiration, just how good it was to bring all these things together. So out of a very sad situation with the death of Morton Feldman, actually came something much later, which was inspirational and and kind of about him, in actual fact. I did, in actual fact, um, my other teacher, Jonathan Harvey, died in 2012 and um, of uh, motor neuron disease, which was awful. And so I dedicated my PhD to them. So, uh, so uh, on to the next piece. I, having written Alleluia, and everyone now thinks I'm the conventional composer, I'm now um, thinking about a piece that I wrote for my own ensemble, Adam, it was called. Now, um, every maybe we should just have one minute of the opening of Adam, um, which is the next piece, and just and this was written in 1989, so a few years after um, I'd left university and I just finished studying with Jonathan Harvey as a postgrad composer. Is Adam? Yeah. Uh, just just before just before we will listen to Adam. Just before I have well, it's not a question. It's just a coincidence that you mentioned that you were studying viola and then you came mm -hmm. uh, to study with Morton Feldman. And I immediately thought about uh, viola in my life, mm -hmm. which is which is kind of something well, which is a side for me. It just just that just a remark. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, well. Let me actually before we hear Adam, let me respond to that actually because what was fascinating. Of course, I knew the viola in my life, but in actual fact, when when I met Feldman, he had only just completed and had a performance of Coptic Light the massive orchestral piece. And the first thing he did in our lesson was simply play that piece. And, and it was, it's about half an hour long. And, wow. you know, here I am giving you little two minute snippets of things. He just sat, we sat down and played that piece. And by the end of it, I was thinking, I really had been put somewhere else, like a, a parallel universe or something. And I thought, this is extraordinary. And wow. uh, it had such, such an impact, even thinking back to that time has had such an incredible impact. And, and actually what was interesting, Feldman's remarks about my own music um, were that I very much like folk song. I was very interested in knowing about harmony and all the things that we think we learn at university and everything else. But I also added in some of my own character into that. And it was interesting when I saw early Feldman pieces, how influenced as I knew he was by Bartok. And, and such composers. So um, it's like a kind of lineage, like a, a, a passing on of ideas. And, and Feldman would say so many things that even to this day resonate with me. I hold a pen in my hand to make a note if I need to. I used to write my scores in pencil. And he said, it's like you're just wearing short trousers. You haven't grown up yet you're not committed to those notes. Mm -hmm. So he, he said, you must write in pen, because when you write in pen, it's, it's there forever. Now, we all know there are pens you can rub out, but aside from that, um, in actual fact, he, there were so many little things he would say that were so inspirational, I'm, some of which I'm sure he would say to many other people. So I, I wasn't alone in that, but it was kind of extraordinary. And in actual fact, he gave me he created this thing called the Tippet Prize, uh, which he gave me at that time, so that I could come back and afford to come back in successive years to Dartington and carry on the summer study. So he was also a very forward thinking and generous person in that way. So um, I, of anyone who's not aware of Morton Feldman's music who might be listening, please just try they're all kinds of different pieces. The Viola in My Life series is fantastic. Rothko Chapel is an inspiration. Violin Concerto. It copped it like it's endless. It's a it's an amazing um, catalogue. And as a, a, a director of Ipsy and the artistic director for so long, we've had enormous pleasure in, in recording an awful lot of Feldman's work and performing it as well. So I feel, I feel very um, fortunate to have had that contact. But actually, in honesty, that's one contact in many as composers. I've never been shy 
to go and talk to composers and and try and find and musicians and artists to find out um how they think and what they do and and i've always mostly had a very good response to that and very positive so um Feldman was a, a wonderful example. So back to Adam. Now, Adam, before you actually hear it, connects up extremely well with another composer I work with a lot, a British composer called Harrison Birtwistle, um, famous for writing lots of operas and lots of things. He wrote his uh, one of his operas was based on Punch and Judy. And in actual fact, I'm obsessed with Punch and Judy and the whole simple story of these puppets kind of having their fights and their conversations and what have you and i was quite jealous that he had got in years before and writing that opera because it's the kind of thing i thought i'd like to do that so i got in perhaps one over on him because his son is called adam and so when this piece was performed he said i wanted to write a piece called adam how did you get to do that and and so we laughed about this because i said well there we go you wrote punch and judy i wrote adam we're 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 square now we're fine you know and um yeah so and we continued to have quite a laugh for many years from there so this is adam and i hope you'll notice very very different in terms of the way it's put together from alleluia so we're just here maybe one one minute or so as a kind of sound bite Good, good. Okay, so this is Thank Adam, you, sir. Okay. One, one, one minute of Adam, let's say. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, somewhat different in atmosphere to um, Alleluia. <laughs> That's totally different. Thank you so much. Just before, before you continue, um, I just wanted to say, I think I forgot to do this in the beginning, that we will upload all the links to this uh, YouTube chat and we will do this after the after the meeting so because we will keep the recording of the meeting for for a while so there will be a description of the video with all the links to the website of andrew truvi to all the links to all the music uh, that uh, he refers to today and and i'm extremely sorry that we have to cut you know to stop the pieces after one minute or uh, one minute and a half i know this is this is basically no go you cannot do this with a piece of music but uh, that's just to give a general impression so that's what we talked with andrew uh before before the meeting has started so thank you thank you so much thank you i know normally i i exactly like feldman did with me to play cocked it lie and it was half an hour long and as I say, normally you get two minute sound bites and what have you. So I know on this occasion it's not ideal, but as Sergey just said very kindly, everything will be there um, to listen through fully if, if one wishes and much more. So, so far we've, we've had the 
let's say traditional side of me we've had a more extreme i got very interested and still am in extremes of pitches so the very highest on the flute and the oboe then the very lowest oboe and clownet rather than the very lowest we could have on trombones and cello double bass etc i got very interested in extremes um some of you will hear perhaps resonances from people like Zanarkis, uh, maybe even some chelsea various composers that have been very um fundamentally important to me um but also i was just very interested in in being quite extreme in terms of my emotional um thrust if you like so that that's kind of two different sides so far now the other one um which is our third piece called cantus firmus is my as i said earlier my enduring interest from all things around me now one of the things i played as a student on the piano regularly as we all do is some bach and um i thought i i love it some of it i'm not terribly good at playing but i try my best um and i thought what can i what can i do with someone like bark um i'm playing it but am i is it in my music have i somehow find found a link to incorporate some bark within my music so i immediately um someone asked me to write a piano piece and i thought okay i'm going to use bark and i'm going to use pieces that i played either on the viola or on the piano. So all I did was a collage of all the different Bach that I could think of at that time. And basically, um, one might say it turned into a kind of Nankaro-esque kind of crazy piano piece where unlike Nankaro, where he used um, player pianos to kind of make these roles. So it wasn't actually human beings playing it. Uh, this is a human being playing this piece. So I was interested in how much can I put in there that has this kind of overall effect of being a, a collage of Bach, but also becomes something else as well. So for instance, as an example, the stabbing lower chords are literally the chord progressions in the first prelude. And instead they were wrong, you know, they're very much more kind of violently um, done. So this piece lasts about a minute. So we're actually going to hear the piece in its entirety um, to please people who like to hear whole things. And what I got into, this is one of the first pieces I got into the notion of what can I capture within the time of about a minute? You know, you're quite often asked to write pieces, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Sometimes you're asked to write very short music. How can I capture that little aspect of the world within that little short space of time? And this was written um, in 92, so still quite a long time ago. And Cantus Firmus, the very top line is a kind of Cantus. Um, there we are. That's enough enough um, analysis of it, I think. Um, and actually, the piece was um, also inspired by an artist called Bridget Riley, who used to put a lot of bits of paper, different colored paper together in different patterns and find out how they work together. And I once watched her do this for a couple of hours and I found it just fascinating how she, the, just the different hues of color just slightly changing each time were absolutely fascinating. So here we are, Cantus Firmus. Cantus Firmus, perfect, thank you. That's number three. Yeah, right. So this time it's going to be the whole piece because it's last yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Your headphone. Oh, thank you. Your, Brilliant. Yeah. Who, was, uh, who was playing the piece? Who was the first performer? Oh, the first performer was Nicholas Hodges. Okay. Um, I'm trying, I'll be absolutely honest, offhand, I can't think, um, it's, I think it might be Nicholas, or else it's Michael Finnessy, um, I think it, mm, I think it's Nick, Nick Hodges playing it there, actually, yeah, so I, I quite, on YouTube, I quite like, some of these things I put up quite a time ago, I quite like to put up the initial performances of pieces, because, well, one, the people have asked for them, and, and it's been a part of, how the piece has been performed. Um, so th that is actually Nick Hodges, yeah, because there's a, a couple of slower performances on there as well. I've yet, have you noticed at the beginning of the score, there is also in brackets PPP, so you could play the piece really yeah. quietly. But in actual fact, I've yet to hear that because that is beyond <laughs> beyond reality to some extent to try and get all of that together but i've been most impressed over the years at how people have managed to get their hands around all of that i must say and it, it's kind of i i don't know if it makes you smile a little bit um sometimes i think we we could do with more music that makes us smile every so often and that seems so kind of calamitous you kind of think it's it's a bit crazy <laughs> really so it's kind of fun you know yeah. yeah so um to continue um as time goes on of course i've i've like most composers i've explored many different genres and different styles and different ways of thinking about music and i don't personally like just categorize music and say we do one thing or we do another thing even by the three examples you've heard already i like a big range of music now that causes problems because people by nature want to categorize you they'd like to put you in a box hopefully not one as a dead composer dare i say you know <laughs> but in a box kind of saying that you are a minimalist, you are uh, simplicity, you are um, unbelievably complex, you know, what a spectral, whatever, you know. Um, and I, I kind of like to break those barriers down and to try different things out. And the next piece is probably a very good example of that. Um, it's called Ya, 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 Nay, 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 Nay. And uh, basically, it's a piece of art by one of my all-time favorite artists called Joseph Boyce, who was a, a German artist. And when I first went to Darmstadt, and I don't mean Darmstadt in the 50s, I'm not that old, um, Darmstadt in the early 90s, I went to an exhibition um, they had in the gallery in Darmstadt, would you believe, of Boyce. And um, I, I don't know if I should, I will say this, I actually spent more time in that exhibition than I did going to the contemporary music concert. So, you know, someone will tell me off for doing that, but I had such a fantastic time in there. It was absolutely wonderful. And I saw this piece made of felt um, and just kind of put together rather randomly by by Boyce, and I just loved it. And I thought, and it was called Ya 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 Nay 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 Nay, or in English, Yes 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 No 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 No. And so, even by the way I'm saying it, you can hear I'm setting it up to have a kind of slightly minimal sense about it. And so, what happens? It moves the piece Ya 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 Ya, and then Nay 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 have two different chords attached to them so that it just moves between and you have an ensemble in this case it's Ixian again my own ensemble it was first performed actually by a dutch ensemble um but i particularly like this recording of it so um let's hear this so let's just hear maybe a minute or so of ya 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 nay 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 okay Thank you. 
okay i think they get the message <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Actually, um, I apologise. There's actually hearing that that is the new ensemble from uh, from Amsterdam that perform that 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 is their performance. As I said, I I often keep to the original performances where I can, um, and that is actually um, that and and that was actually um, commissioned by one of their um, piano players, John Schneider. Um, to be performed, so it's it's nice to hear that. Um, in recording prediction, I actually joined in and was going yeah 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 nay 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 etc. So um, you did you blessing you don't have to hear that today <laughs> at the moment. So immediately once again a very different type of piece repetition simplicity simplicity in its chordal structure uh bass clarinet doing kind of almost jazzy kind of thrown away things um someone like oscar peterson type piano um passages as well very simple uh left hand parts of the piano as well so lots of different elements of things that interest me including jazz actually coming in coming into that piece so uh, once again just just looking at how we can think about combining different types of activity um yeah so that's one way of thinking about it. now the other side of me which i mentioned earlier is an interest in folk music um from all over the world i've collected it um kind of obsessively i suppose for years um recently when we had what we call over here our first lockdown because of the pandemic and we were all kind of more or less confined to our homes and not able to go out terribly much um i decided to look through my old collection of 78 records which are these very old very fast moving records and found well knowingly that i had a big collection of world music um, there and so what I started to do is record them just literally film the record going around and I put many things up on YouTube so if you're interested in music from around the world um, that is less usual not not stuff that you hear all the time perhaps now um, these records go back over a hundred years in actual fact more 120 years maybe and um, are incredibly forward thinking of the people who recorded them to actually go into um, all kinds of very unknown places at that time imagine at the start of the um, 20, 20th century 1910 actually going and recording things in very hidden areas um, in india in africa in in russia actually all over so there's a huge amount up there to have a listen to so um and I'd really appreciate um, people listening to that because I, I do think, as I say, we're getting as the global world gets smaller. Somehow we forget to to listen to things that are right there waiting to be heard, and we're kind of concentrate on our own little path. So it's quite good to look at that. Anyway, so the reason I mentioned folk music, uh, my family come originally from Scotland. Um, cold and rainy actually very beautiful place cold and rainy as well um but i love it and um so one of the first pieces i was asked to write by um the first wife of james clapperton actually charlene harshanin um was called lament strathspey and real for solo violin and this was from um also quite early on in the late 80s and basically um the, the opening started off, starts off with a drone on the D string and then a very embroidered embellished melody around that single note. It goes into um, a saspe, which is kind of bouncing around a lot, and then the reel, which is quite fast. I mean, what might be quite nice, Sergei, I don't know if it's possible, is to play perhaps the opening 20 or 30 seconds or so and then drag the bar along to the reel just to show a little bit of the end of the piece just to give a bit of the character of that and and it's quite obviously based on scottish fiddle music um so if it's possible to try that see what happens Yeah, I, I forgot. I forgot this always. So uh, we are going to have, let's say, twenty seconds of of the beginning of the opening. 
20 or 30 seconds and then the same at the end yeah near the end yeah just to show the different character good yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Maybe that's not happening. Uh, yeah, just a moment. Uh, we'll do this. Yeah. It really sounds very, very Scottish. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and I think it's kind of it's a kind of on the one hand, there's uh, of course you can feel that there is a, a folk inspiration in the music. On the other hand, it's not really folk music, so it's 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 a professional rhythm music, so it's notated and you can feel it even even if you don't see the score, even if you just listen in the uh, the work. Great. Yeah. In actual fact, I'm I'm keen to capture um, what I want to do, but also to have that that connection with with folk music in that way, or with other musics. I I think sometimes perhaps composers spend quite a lot of time thinking I must get away from I must always be totally individual and not connected with other composers or with other people. I feel the opposite. I feel I want that community. I want that connection. I want that relationship, that conversation with other music. So to me, it gets more important, more important. And in actual fact, I, I didn't quite mean it to go quite so effectively together, but the piece out that I wrote for um, two pianos and orchestra, um, a double piano concerto effectively, um, Basically, um, it's it's kind of interesting. When I first went to, with the ICM, I went to Warsaw um, with the ICM and had some pieces performed and had a, a, a fabulous time out there. It was my first time in Warsaw and um, looking around the town and and realizing that here we are. I was in a square, Wenceslas Square, which is the most beautiful square, and I suddenly did not realize 
to be honest, that the square had more or less been destroyed during the war and in actual fact had been reconstructed looking at a Canaletto paintings and, and various pictures and things. And that was a shock to me to see that the facade was so effectively capturing what it was originally. But behind that facade was all this new stuff going on and you see that regularly now in in london where you see a beautiful building and it's just got the front of it that all the rest of it is knocked down and gone and they're building a completely new construction with the front looking like the original and that whole idea fascinated me and what really sealed this idea for me was when we went into the cathedral which contained a casket in the wall which was had chopin's heart Friedrich Chopin's heart in this casket, and it was actually there. And um, it, it kind of shocked me to think about, there's a composer I absolutely love. I struggle to play his piano music in any way. I would never play it publicly. You're not about to hear me play Chopin, so don't worry. Um, and, and, it, and, it, and this combination of this facade in the square and the heart of Chopin being there conjured up something that I had to have some kind of relationship in my own music, in my own way of thinking with Chopin. So rather like I had with Bach in the Cantus, in the Cantus Firmus, I, I basically took lots of Chopin and lots of bits of my own music, once again um, collage them. Perhaps I, I should have been an artist for real because I love putting things together. Perhaps my favourite person who collaged things was someone like Robert Rauschenberg, one of the Americans who I was inspiring as well. And just the way he put visual images together was so um, perfect and, and, and so meaningful for me that somehow how I put this piece together became like that. When this piece was rehearsed, it was done by um, very well-known pianist here called Joanna McGregor, who, who plays lots of contemporary music, and another fellow artist, um, Andrew West. And both of them, with their pure love of Chopin, as I think most pianists do, um, said, oh, but we can't play them at different times and different tempos. And, and, and they, they were really like, oh, how are we going to do this? Because it was like I was being quite naughty with Chopin. Um, and in the end, they realized actually how, how I hope um, people will feel um, effective playing with music from other parts of the world might, might be, or, and, and other composers, not, not just from, from Poland, you know. So anyway, let, let's hear maybe two, two, two minutes or so of the second movement of Out. And this movement is the reflective movement, which basically, well, you can hear, you can decide what you think I'm doing with Chopin here. So let's hear, let's hear maybe two, three minutes. Okay, now let's do this.
good. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, interestingly enough, actually, as I was listening to that myself, it reminded me of one of the things that Morton Feldman said to me, which had a positive and a negative side. Um, I, I was working with Jonathan Harvin. He was trying to get me to write um, electroacoustic music, so electronic music and things. And I wasn't sure because I'm not very technically minded and I wasn't sure at that time how I would do that. And, and Feldman said to me, I've yet to hear one single long note played beautifully on a tuba without interruption, which I, th I think is a bit of an exaggeration because I've heard tuba players and trombone players play very lovely, beautiful, lo long notes. Um, and this piece, there I am, all I do is decorate it with one note. Um, and each instrument, you hear it on an oboe, you hear it on a flute, you hear it on a different, and just the difference in sound quality of those instruments, to me, is enough to just really enjoy that sound. So, um, yeah, it's interesting how even years later, little kind of comments that are made to you can have such resonance um, when you least expect it to happen. And it just occurred to me, having talked about Feldman earlier, that that kind of idea is implicitly there. So it's kind of enjoyable. But like you can imagine for the performers who play lots of beautiful Chopin, suddenly they were like cutting it about and how we decided to put it together. And and the outer movements, it's in three movements. Um, you know, they, they have a drum kit in them and they're they're, they're all, you know, they're having a lot of fun, actually, um, in playing all these different bits. And um, what's interesting, I, I, in actual fact, that piece generated, it was very well received at the time by the audience and things, but it generated a really horrid um, critical response in, in one of the newspapers here, um, where one of the um, critics said, it's like he stabbed Chopin in the heart. And initially, I was incredibly, even to this day, I kind of think, what a horrid thing to say. I, he didn't, this guy didn't know that I'd been and seen Chopin's heart in Warsaw. And there he is saying that I've stabbed it because I'd kind of like mutilated Chopin. And, and, and the thing that made me then think, well, actually, um, Chopin is such an unbelievably strong composer he can take being slightly ripped apart and slightly, it's like you take a, a sheet music and you rip it up and you put it back together again. Chopin is so strong that the essence of him is clearly still there. I know, I know in that example, he's much less perhaps chopped around than he is in other bits of the music, but it's still very fundamentally, no one would go away not thinking, ah, oh, Chopin you know and respect to Chopin so um I don't know you know it's a bit like we're, we're coming on to a, a piece of mine which is called Ubu's Journey and one thing I haven't mentioned I've written four operas um in in the time and my first opera was called Ubu and in actual fact funnily enough one of the critics of that said oh it's like a carry-on film now I don't know in Russia if you know about these carry-on films, they're kind of slapstick, innuendo, silly comedy um, films uh, made in the in the sixties in the Ealing Road studios, and very British humour, very unsubtle and innuendos about parts of the body and all kinds of different things, and they're they're enormously funny. Um, and, and he also mentioned it was like watching a Punch and Judy show. And those are two of my favorite kind of things, silly comedy and things like Punch and Judy. So in trying to be a little bit critical of me, he kind of nailed what I was trying to do. And um, this Ubu was written during the time when in, we were having lots of pit political struggles here. And we had just got over having a, a woman called Margaret Thatcher as our prime minister. And Ubu is like the kind of worst of all these kind of dictator types and these kind of people. Margaret Thatcher was known as what's called the milk snatcher because she stopped young children in school has been able to have free milk. And milk is good for the body and what have you. So she was not 
necessarily a, a, a particularly nice person. Um, so Ubu is one of those characters, a bit like a clown. And I don't know whether anyone thinks in the world we might have any clowns in any important positions at the moment, but um, let's just, you can decide who we might be talking about. Um, oh, my goodness. So in that fact, Ubu is a character um, from a Jari play, a French play, Ubu Wa, King Ubu. Um, basically, that that was a kind of dictator, but a clown and a kind of buffoon. And, and like the court jester, if you like, and the person that everyone jokes about and laughs about, but is also underhandedly doing some really horrid things at the same time. So it's a real balance of, of how things are. Anyway, I wrote the operas. I'm not really, apart from what I've just said, going into them today, but um, I, also, I wrote um, an orchestral piece based on some of the material of the opera. And um, what happens, this is quite an extensive piece. It's in two parts, because early on in uh, YouTube, you could only put a certain amount of time up of, of music. So it's in two parts. It's about half an hour long and um, kind of explores this, this character kind of wandering through the world and what goes on in the world. And uh, I thought maybe it, it's difficult, but maybe we could hear just a um, couple of minutes of that. Yeah, just full orchestra. Thank you. 
No. In a, in actual fact, that opening um, exactly as I I wanted sets up a very a relatively slow, serene passing once again a a, a kind of folk melody type sound around etc not too much excitement yet um the piece progress and 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 gives the impression initially that this ubu character is a very mostly very calm kind of a bit bumbling but kind of mostly okay kind of character and within the next couple of minutes the score goes completely off the rails and becomes kind of ridiculous at times and extremely violent at times and um over the course of the half hour there's an array of emotional kind of um senses within this that are, are um sometimes quite shocking because i i hear i've heard over the years people saying oh they laugh at bits and other bits they're like so shocked by it so you've got these really extreme emotions coming through so if you have the time and the patience do do listen to more of that also there's an early kind of almost like circus outbreak uh which sounds like a little bit of bad mozart symphony or something mm -hmm. um which i actually wrote when i was 11 and uh i found a, a manuscript paper with this rather untidy writing on and and it was this little piece that i wrote so i actually incorporated something that i wrote when i was actually at school at 11 years old so and and just for the fun of it and it fits in very well and it's quite a shock when it comes along so see what you think i'm i'm almost like a film trailer or something leading into the what the story is going to be you know so anyway i'm i'm wondering now sergey are there are, are there any questions at the moment or any thoughts or think people uh, want to ask or you want to ask uh there there is something i wanted to ask but um so this is a kind of general general question so i just thought that uh, the way you approach different genres, different influences, is very natural. So that's that's what I feel, and that's what I've always felt with your music. So it's it's so natural. And you know, how do you find um, how do you find opportunities? You know, to for performances actually, because it doesn't fit really into well. I mean, today it's not not fortunately it's not that important anymore. But let's say 20, 30, 40 years back. I believe it would make a problem, you know, just to find a place, place to program it, to find the right audience, to find, you know, a festival with the right format because because of this format, you know. I'm not talking explicitly about the Darmstadt, but uh, just, you know, different, uh, different influences, different approaches that were extremely strong at the moment. And that's normal because when there is a fresh style, normally it's getting extremely strong in the beginning you know it wants to establish itself and you as i said at the very beginning and uh, um, you know the, the the talk today has just strengthened my uh, my idea that uh, you really skillfully avoid any any kind of uh, conventions so you do not fit to any of those uh, of those labels and yeah. so how do you manage, uh, just a very general but practical question, so how did you manage? I mean, now it's it's easy, but uh, back in 80s or uh, 70s, I think it was quite a problem for you, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, well, certainly. Um, to be honest, a little bit about how the story I said about uh, entering the university as a viola player, in actual fact, I always by nature assume that composing is going to be something i love doing and i have a passion for but it's going to be like something separate you know it's not something you can earn money from or i'll have to struggle to get a performance and things and actually by that complete chance person saying oh you're a composer um actually it, it it became like it, it's very difficult to to in in all honesty what actually happened was that i would write a piece um and then someone would perform it initially so that's a start yes and and you have to make sure people know that you're a composer um and then someone would contact me and said oh i really liked that string quartet you wrote would you like to write a viola concerto 
And I, I'm, I kid you not, the consistency of which this has happened over the years is quite shocking. I remember one important time when I had a phone call from a, a woman called Edelyn Rothwell, who was Lady Barbara Ollie, who was actually um, an oboe player and, and married to the conductor, Sir John Barbara Ollie. And she phoned and, and I literally on my phone, she said, oh, I heard a piece of yours on the radio and I was wondering if you would write an oboe concerto. I thought there was someone taking the mick, <laughs> you know, and, and, and joking. And I said, oh, yeah, of course I will. That'll be lovely. She said, oh, well, can you come over for lunch? and we can discuss it. And, you know, I still wondered. And in actual fact, that seems to have been consistent from that time when a lady in university said, oh, would you write a Christmas carol? And off I wrote a Christmas. To someone phoning me and saying, would you like to write an oboe concerto? It, it truly has been a little bit random. Um, I'd love to be able to say I have an agent and a publisher who do all that work. I don't. I did have a publisher for a while, Boozy and Hawks, um, but I don't have those kind of that that mechanism behind yeah. me. It's yeah. purely been um, almost by word of mouth. People hear something and they suddenly think, oh, I like that. Would you write something else? And obviously running my own ensemble, we would, of course, play my music as well as over the time you can look on the Ixian ensemble website and you can see we probably asked had 300 or more different pieces played by people from all all over the world and and that's partly because of my passion for not just thinking about only me but actually thinking about um, other composers and other musicians and making them part of my world and in a funny way that has come back in a very good way in the sense that people are you know, I'll hear my music and ask me to write other things. So you know, it, it, I, I'd like to be able to give you a structure and a, and a way that happened, but it actually was honestly quite random. Even my first orchestral piece, Red Icon, um, I was at a concert and someone was talking about um, how beautiful the Shostakovich symphony was being performed. And uh, number 10, one of my favorites, by the way, um, and I was saying, I was talking about how I loved certain sounds. And they said, oh, you sound like you should write an orchestral piece. And I said, oh, I wish. And they said, oh, well, I happen to be the controller of the BBC. <laughs> 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 I didn't even know. I didn't even realize, you know. I thought this is just someone in the audience I was chatting to. Would you write, write an or I was like, <laughs> so I'm afraid to say it has been, John Cage would laugh at the fact of how much chance there has been in my life. Yeah, and I really mean that. It's extraordinary how often, by chance, things have happened. It's crazy. Even recently, the piece that I've got at the end of my list called You Know Me, um, which is like a Japanese vase, is for percussion quartet. That was performed in Berlin in August this year. This year, pandemic wow. year, August. Wow. In Berlin, I went to Berlin and they actually um, asked me about this piece at the beginning of the year. And I thought, well, I won't get right in it because it's not going to happen in this time. And then suddenly they phoned me and said, oh, we'd like to record it. And then I got I finally got on with it. And then they said, oh, we're going to perform it. So the chance in Canada and then there's a beautiful recording and film made of it, which is on YouTube, and we might get the chance to hear a little bit of it. And and somehow that all of this chance in Canada's and, and now they're going to be putting it onto a CD for next year. So none of this I could have predicted, none of it I realized. I don't know personally the performers. It was just a you know, a, a, you know, someone who'd heard my stuff and played some of it in the past thought I might like to do this. You know, so life is life is incredibly by chance sometimes. And that means it's very difficult to to grab a hold of, to know for sure what might happen. You know, so when I stopped doing my PhD with Feldman and I started it only recently, I didn't realise it was going to be such a a rewarding experience and I'd avoided it for you know what 20 or 30 years you know so you just don't know what's going to happen and that doesn't help anyone out there trying to find their first 
commission or find their first um, performance. I think the bottom line is if you are the sort that can connect up with people and try and form um, relationships with people that you get on with, um, it just seems to work. And I can think of people I've known most of my life or I still work with now who have, you know, it's just been an enormous, um, fantastic kind of journey in that sense. So I don't know. Does that help? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. That's, that's fantastic. I would just add that probably, yeah, speaking about the chances, it, it's good. But there is something else that's, you know, that's the genuinity of the music. So it's your being yourself in your music that probably makes people to approach you like you said you did when you were a student that you approached yeah. other composers musicians just that because it's just yeah. about exchange it's not about power about relationships about business about infrastructure it's just about yeah. relationship personal relationships and relationships with the music and i i believe that i cannot prove this but i believe that the people would feel this i mean if i would go to a concert of yours and I would listen to a music live, I would also probably have a feeling that, yeah, there is something I wanted, I wanted to talk about, or there is something I want to ask, or just that, just because it's, it's, it's so natural that it's unusual, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I suppose, cause I've never, I've never really thought about music being a job or work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, um, that's... To me, music is a passion. Now, you know, someone is probably out there thinking, oh, OK, so how does he earn money? How does he survive? You know, because um, I, I came from what over here is called a working class background. I had there was no money behind me. I had to I had to work to make sure that every you know, I, I could live in a home and all the rest of it, like like most people. So there was nothing. It wasn't like, oh, I've got a ton of money, I don't need to think about it. I did. So, of course, I taught, um, and I very much enjoyed working with young students and all the rest. And, and that was another side of my life, which, you know, was very important to me, all my teaching. I'm still doing it now at Birmingham and very much enjoying it. And to me, it's important to get that balance between you have to do things where you can earn money to live, but your, your music has to be your passion. And by chance, people have come along and they have, you know, I have been commissioned to write a lot of pieces. And I've also written a lot of pieces completely for free. This percussion quartet I wrote recently, they asked me and I thought, well, why not? And in actual fact, the benefit to me was immense, much more than actual money, because just to yeah. see the performance and see in this time, I know we spoke briefly earlier about there are still some concerts able to go on with limitations in Russia. In, in England, that was the same, but it's so much less now. And I go clearly to a lot of concerts and a lot of things as much as I can. So I really miss that reality. And in actual fact, I miss all of those connections. But also we are finding ways of, of reconnecting with people, even though it's on a screen and I'm in my sitting room. I'm not in, in a lovely hall in, in Moscow. I'm, I'm in my sitting room. Um, and I know I'd like, I'd prefer to be in Moscow, frankly. I'd love to, I'd love to be there. Um, but, you know, you, you, we have to find other ways of doing things. So I've been very impressed with how much music is still able to go on in this kind of new reality that we have at the moment. So it's, it's just, it's, it just goes to show just how impressive um, musicians and the want for music to keep going has been in this time. I'm, I'm, really shocked and delighted by that but i also want it to go back to i want to be able to see people for real playing and singing and enjoying their music as well so i think we fingers crossed for that actually are there any other questions or any other thoughts at the moment uh just a moment uh, no for, for for the moment it's it's quite clear <laughs> i've okay. i've frightened everyone off <laughs> 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 well look let me let me rather than listen to any more I'll, i'm just going to say um a little bit about the other pieces i chose to focus on one of them was finally 
Um, I'd written Ubu's Journey. No, actually, I hadn't written Ubu's Journey. I'd written something for the BBC. And um, basically, I, I was having a conversation with a performer and, and someone said, well, you're a viola player. Why have you never written a viola concerto? Or, or a lot more for the viola. So I thought, yeah, okay. And then while we were talking, someone came up and said, oh, I'm looking about thinking about getting a um, commissioning a viola concerto. Would you be interested once again? And this was um, Lawrence Power, who's a most fabulous viola player. And so basically um, I wrote this half hour viola concerto, which he's performed a number of times. And, um, uh, basically, I, I went back even beyond Chopin, everyone. I started looking at one of my favorite opera composers, uh, Rameau, the French composer Rameau. And in actual fact, I did, I remember at university, they were always trying to get us to do kind of pastiche, kind of copies of composers. How well can you do a Haydn string quartet? Can you compose and orchestrate like Stravinsky? Can you write a four-part chorale in the style of whoever, you know. And so I, I basically looked at Ramo and kind of did lots of versions of Ramo and also tried to capture my whole early life as a viola player, learning scales, learning different double stops, learning the harmonics, all the different techniques that I learned as a young viola player. I, I kind of tried to use some of those within this piece. So it, it's, a, it's quite an extensive piece. Also, it has an influence of the school I was teaching in, which had a lot of students from um, India. Um, and basically I, I learned to play the a little bit, not well again, on the tabla, the, the kind of bongo drum type of drums, and also the harmonium. Mm -hmm. And which is like a piano, but you have a squeeze box, so it's kind of single handed thing. And I've got the harmonium within the the second movement of the viola concerto. And also the piece after that called Contracto is for harmonium and tabla. Um, and that was something I wrote, which is about half an hour long again, which just gradually unfolds single melodic ideas very slowly with rhythm rhythmic things added from the tabla and i kind of i don't know i i suppose as time goes on i've got more and more into trying to not write one minute or five minute pieces but kind of extend the text of these pieces over a much longer time nothing by the way of one thing oh that's a bit like feldman writing a piece that's an hour and a half or something nothing quite like that I, have, I haven't got to the point of doing that. And if you listen to the Feldman pieces, you realise that he puts many, many different textual elements in his pieces and they're constantly changing. They're rarely one kind of meditation. They're always changing their structure. Um, a, a year or so ago, I saw the second string quartet of Feldman, which is five hours long and uh, in a performance and it was absolutely mind mesmerizing but not because it was like meditating it was just constantly changing so your brain had to keep up with all of these changes all the time and i found that quite fascinating so my head is still thinking about how i might think about a piece absolutely constantly changing I know my music changes quite a lot as it goes along, but it's not as as quick and as refined as the Feldman would be. So I'm I'm giving that some thought. So um, to conclude, my my final piece, you know me for um, percussion quartet. Basically, um, as as you know from earlier, I've collected and listened to folk music for my whole life, and collected means I literally have an awful lot of actual handwritten um, folk music collections um, going back from Bartok, you know, up to many, many things from Korea, China, Japan, everywhere. And um, I, I took snippets of those and once again collage lots of things together. I also wrote a lot of folk music myself. So you might call it fake folk music, I don't know. Um, and incorporated that into this final percussion quartet. It's the kind of piece that benefits, if I dare say, from listening to the whole thing, because you get moments which are very fluid, 
and open and then moments which come exactly together and the players have to play things exactly together but i it's one of the most open scores i've ever written because it allows many interpretations of how you decide to put things together and as i say I said slightly earlier the performance in berlin was absolutely spectacular because we decided before we the performance that i wouldn't come to the rehearsals mm -hmm. and I, i just arrived in berlin so in actual fact as i became a tourist and i went and had a wonderful time looking around berlin when things weren't quite so locked down and basically really enjoyed that town. I went back to the Reichstag, which I hadn't seen since Christo, the artist, had wrapped it. And, and very sadly, Christo had, had died um, just before I started to write this percussion quartet. So it's actually dedicated to him. And it was odd that I ended up in Berlin, um, actually standing in front of a building. I stood in front of with Christo when it was wrapped um in all in all this amazing fabric so um yeah it's it's funny how things artistically come together sometimes you imagine the world is all these separate things but sometimes things just gel together and connect in an in a most strange way that um most unexpected it couldn't have been better to have it in berlin and having not been at the rehearsal when they performed this piece i felt like slightly like a member of the audience because i wasn't sure what was going to happen next mm -hmm. and that right. was really exciting and suddenly i was like wow this thing could go in a really awful direction <laughs> or it could actually go quite well and very difficult uh, that so that was a very enjoyable time of of this year to see a, a piece which was open enough for me to feel like it was new, new to me okay right um sergey i probably talked quite enough <laughs> um <laughs> i i uh, hope i am put anyone off my music um <laughs> uh, uh, do you want us to listen to it now or do you want us to, to, to no i i think yeah. we can all we can all listen to it um at our, at our time because i think um you're quite right um i'm not a great fan of snippets of music and and yeah the three pieces that i've chosen at the end are more to be able to listen yeah. um fully if, if you have the time and the patience to do I that i think so i think so because just following following your thoughts uh, you just described the pieces and i have the impression that really you should you should take time to to to, to take a plunge into the music i and hope so yeah so then uh, we have we have another a few questions if you if you if you don't yeah. mind yeah yeah uh, two of them are well. This basically man makes one question. Um, you 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 told us you told us about your experience with uh, your brief experience with uh, Morton Feldman, and obviously, it's clear that it was although brief but very important for you and for your for your artistic personality and for your personality probably. Mm -hmm. Uh, a question was about uh, your experience with Jonathan Harvey and and Michael Finnessy, because all those three all those three uh, teachers of yours they're totally different. I mean they're really totally different, and uh, exactly like you mentioned that uh, you do not belong actually to any school or or, or style or direction there. Yeah? Because on the first side, if you just scroll uh, through your biography and you see that. Okay, Andrew Truvis started with Michael Finnessy. The very first thought is, okay, that's got to be something complex or, or new complex or I don't know, which is absolutely not the case because, uh, I mean, it's still a, quite a strange idea to label all those composers. I mean, Michael Finnessy, Brian Furderhoe, Chris Dench, uh, Barrett, whoever else, to label them all under new complexity. The idea of of, of two was was relevant uh, 50 years ago, but probably not anymore. Anyway, so that was the question. That would be the question about your experiences with uh, Harvey and Finnessy. Yeah. Well, first of all, about the whole um, categorizing people, um, it's very interesting because um, an, another one of the new complexity was called um, James Dillon. Yeah. And um, in actual fact, I'm very lucky. He lives not far down the road from me, actually, um, about half a mile away. And he, he all, uh, he, Richard Barrett, Chris Dench, all um, Roger Redgate, all those people, Michael Finnessy, all of them 
feel like they've been slightly put put into a kind of a, a box which they almost can't get out of and and it's become a point even now here we are where their names can't come up without thinking about the new complexity and in a way if you know i've known michael finnessy for you know nearly 40 years now and and you know you realize that he's written a range of music which is so extraordinary and so different and yes complex at times and everything possible james dylan and richard barrett the same you know and so they've actually had oddly enough more problems about being categorized than i have about being open and not categorized um you know it, it's kind of a weird combination my experience of jonathan harvey i mean if i'm honest with you um he he was um he was actually i'll i'll just say it he was like my father to me i mean the way we we got on uh we used to walk his dog sappho a little little dog um in the woods near where he lived and that were our, that was our, our lessons just talking about life and talking about how things are in a very open way and um i found that absolutely fascinating and sometimes for sure you don't have to spend time talking about specifically music all the time in order to to learn an immense amount actually the the odd thing for me was i was studying with jonathan harvey at university as postgrad and i was studying privately with michael finnessy after he'd given me a prize in huddersfield and thought i was a good composer or whatever i said oh i still need a lot i've got a lot to learn you know can i have some lessons and that started a, a friendship of you know as i say 30 40 years and um they were completely different i was literally pulled from one who would say one thing to another who would more or less say the opposite so in actual fact i ultimately i had to decide which what which bits of the information i wanted to take on board so in actual fact it was quite good to have such opposites teaching me because it meant that i i could basically choose for myself and i i think i was a strong character at that time and quite opinionated and would easily you know i remember certain composers that they were trying to get me interested in i'll, I'll just say no they don't interest me at the moment mm. And so, you know, I was one of those annoying students who would actually debate about what I think I should be listening to and what I should be involved with. But that's partly because even as a, a, a late teenager, I was, I was just fascinated in trying lots of different things. And I didn't want to home in just on one type of thing. I wanted to explore, you know, just to see what else was out there. I don't know if that helps. They were both yeah. excellent teachers. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, they, and it's true that I, I I didn't know that even today uh, the composers that you mentioned, like Chris Dench and the D. Lom and Redgate and Michael Fennessy, that it's still considered to be a kind of niche, you know, a kind of a, a, a labeled group. Because yeah, you know, I, I see I see it's I see it, I mean I understand this is something problematic because obviously they're extremely different. I mean, it's like it's like you say that okay, this is contemporary music, which means that you are a contemporary composer. That I don't know that Britney Spears is contemporary music. Uh, that uh, whatever else is contemporary music, so it doesn't explain anything. So that's more or less the same today, more or less the same with uh, this complexity. Because on the other hand, uh, Franz Schubert music is quite complex, and Chopin is very complex in a way. So, yeah. yeah. So thank you. And then probably the last question that we have is about your plans, because uh, you told us that it was basically by chance, so a little bit Cajun way, that, that, that uh, it, the whole thing has been developed so far. But uh, your plans, I mean, it's difficult to plan today, but what would you love to compose or what you're thinking of now and which directions probably, which inspirations and so whatever? Well, actually it's interesting because i i see when i'm teaching i'm also i i learn every everyone is with each other and with everyone actually as a teacher 
you if you listen to your students not just think i've got the knowledge and i'm passing it on i actually find my students come up with ideas and thoughts that i find really interesting um i don't think it's a one-way thing about teaching i think i le i'm learning from my students as well because they have whole different attitudes and i was aware quite recently of how as i think i said earlier a lot of students aren't listening to music outside dare i say at the moment their bubble they have a bubble of music they listen to and they don't explore much beyond that partly because everything's out there and you think how can i do that so i'm i'm actually writing a series of piano pieces which are going to be based on different parts of the world in actual fact for a friend of mine just to see what i can do and once again how i can incorporate things but as you're probably thinking well i've kind of been there before as well so i'm not i'm not reinventing my wheel and i'm not rethinking things i'm also um in the midst of writing a violin concerto um for someone who who i've been working with for 20 years or so so um that's slow going actually because as you say when when a performance can actually happen i don't know so i don't feel actually a pressure to rush anything at the moment i i think i think for the moment it's little things that come along that i'd like to, to be thinking about and and if, if i've written quite a few little small pieces in the last few months just because people have asked me and and somehow that's happened so there's nothing gigantic happening you know in a year or something but i'm just kind of carrying on as i normally do and and seeing what comes along as vague as that can be actually <laughs> yeah. good hmm. so thank you very much andrew so uh, and then as a conclusion i just wanted to thank you again for being with us today but I thank you for for being sincere in your music and in what you're talking about and just for being what you are I thank think you important today just to be what you are and not yeah. to pretend something else and that's exactly yeah. what you are and i thank you for this i thank you for uh for sharing your ideas your experiences with us and i remind that we will upload all the links uh, in our YouTube chat, uh, in the video description that will be available probably later today or tomorrow as the latest. And we will keep the recordings uh, for, for a certain time. You can find them on the YouTube channel of Moscow Conservatory. And Andrew, I hope there will be a chance that we will be able to welcome you in person here or somewhere else, I don't know. So thank you very much for, for this meeting. That was fantastic talking to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it would be fantastic to try and come out and see you at some point. And if there are any composers listening to this, always write the music that you actually want to write. Don't don't be forced down. A, I must do this because somehow I'll be seen as doing the right thing in a certain small group. Always do what you want to do as a composer. It's it's fundamental. And thank you very much for having me here. And I really hope I do get the chance to come out and meet you all for real at some point soon. Thank okay. you, Andrew. Thank, and thank you. you for looking after all of this, Sergey. That's fantastic. My pleasure. Take good care. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.